want to make sure we have some time to talk about your most recent work with psilocybin and depression. Uh, about three months ago, a study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. You were the senior author on that paper. I've written about it at length, which compared psilocybin to Lexapro, a very, very popular, commonly used, reasonably well tolerated SSRI. Um, do you want to just give people a quick overview of the study design and what you set out to test? Oh, I'd be pleased to. Yes. Yeah. So previously we had done a study, an open trial. We'd taken 20 people with resistant depression. We'd given them uh, a single psilocybin trip and found very good outcome. Uh, but the effect didn't last very long. It, it lasted, you know, two, one to two months. But for many of them, the depression came back. Uh, Based on that, and also some theoretical work I'd done with Robin Carhart Harris, who was with me at the time, he's now moved to UCSF, we came to the conclusion that psychedelics treat depression in a different way to antidepressants. We, and the paper's published in Journal of Psychopharmacology. It's called A Tale of Two Receptors. It's a free download. Uh, feel free to read it because it conceptualizes that there are two ways you can lift depression. One way is with, a, with, with Lexapro or other similar drugs that enhance serotonin in the limbic system. And there they basically block the stress response. And we know that stress is a major cause of depression. You block stress-induced depressive changes in that system. And that allows the limbic system to recover. So that it's a bit like a, if you have a broken leg, you set the leg in plaster so that the bone can heal itself. SSRIs set the limbic system in plaster so over a period of six to eight weeks, they can heal and get you over your depression. And that's through a particular subtype of serotonin receptors called the serotonin 1A receptor, which is in the very expressed in the limbic system. But we think psychedelics, we know psychedelics work in the cortex and they disrupt cortical processing and disrupt, we think, the deep, persistent ruminations and negative thoughts of depression. So we said, let's do a study where we take depressed people, we scan them with fMRI before and after, and then we see if we can look at the, if the brain changes are different with the escitalopram compared with the psilocybin, predicting that we would see cortical differences, that the cortex would be changed by the psilocybin and the subcortical regions would be changed by the escitalopram. So the primary aim of the study was to see if there were differences in brain mechanisms. But of course, we have to know whether there are differences in outcome. So we compared the, the, the mood changing effects of these two drugs. But you couldn't just say, here, you're on Lexapro, here, you're on psilocybin. We had to blind it. And that's quite difficult with psychedelics. So the way we, got, we did that was to tell everyone they were going to get psilocybin. But half the group got a low dose, a placebo dose, a one milligram dose, and half got a high dose, a 25 milligram dose. But they all went through the same psychotherapy. It, depending, it didn't matter what dose they got. They all got all the same preparation and the psychotherapy that goes with a high dose of psilocybin. And then they all got pills, but the escitalopram group got escitalopram and the, the um, psilocybin group got placebo. So they're both getting two pills. One is getting That's right. a placebo plus a high dose of psilocybin, the other. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And the point of that is what's called clinical equipoise. People have to believe that they're getting the best they can. And, and, then, and, and we gave them two doses of psilocybin, whether high or low, one at the start and one after three weeks to see how long the effect would last. And then we measured changes in, in mood and we measured side effects. And we also looked at other aspects of, of depression rather than just looking at depression and scores. We also looked at things like well-being, which is a different way of, of, of looking at how people are feeling. And in the end, on the, the primary measure, there was no difference that psilocybin at six weeks was as good uh, as um, or equal to as uh, uh, escitalopram on that particular measure, which was a, a particular self-report measure called the QUID self-report, which has been used quite extensively in research in the States, particularly in the STAR-D study. But when we looked at all the other measures, uh, actually psilocybin did rather well. Yeah, so I want to pause on that for a sec because um, I, I think that the paper was undersold a little bit. I, I think it was... It, it, it read as a negative study um, yeah. as opposed to a non-inferiority study. Um, Correct. What, why do you think that happened? Do you, do, you, do you think that there was a mistake in the way that, that either the journal treated that or even the way you treated that as the authors? 
Yeah, that's a great question, a very perceptive question. Uh, it's a question I think you should ask the editors of the New England Journal. <laughs> so the reality was, we, it, the truth was, it wasn't, it wasn't powered for non-inferiority. If you want a proper non-inferiority study in psychiatry, takes 150 patients in each arm. We could never afford to do that. There's very few of them have ever been done except by, com well, probably none have been done except by companies. We could not statistically do a non-inferiority study. So we had to just do a kind of comparison. And, uh, and the answer was that, well, we, we had to, pre we, you know, you pre-specify, we pre-specified two outcomes, the quids and the well-being. And it did brilliantly on the well-being, but because that's kind of not, well, that's sort of soft, wishy-washy psychiatry, that we, we, they insisted that we use the quids as the primary. Now, when they, if you don't meet, this is a bit statistical sort of mm -hmm. uh, jargon, really, but if you don't meet your primary, you're not allowed to report the secondaries. It's kind of, it's absolute, it's, it's, it's purism, it's puristic statistics. But as you, as you say, it's kind of not very intuitive because when you look at it, actually it was very clear that the overall, the many, well, there was not a single measure that favored escitalopram. Well, that's that's sort of the thing is, uh, you know, I, I read the paper in great detail and my takeaway was this is very promising because I'm very familiar with, with Lexapro and I'm very familiar with its efficacy, but I'm also very familiar with its side effects and the baggage that comes sure. with it. Most people, yes. uh, you know, for the, for the listener, Lexapro is typically given at two doses, 10 milligrams or 20 milligrams. Going from 10 to 20, there is a so sizable increase in the efficacy, but there's also a sizable increase in the side effects, many of them sexual. And when we're talking about treating young people, old people, middle-aged people, you fix their depression, but you destroy their libido, you're, you're, you're trading one problem for another often. And uh, the, the, the list of patients I've you know, taken care of who can't tolerate these drugs, despite the benefit that they're receiving from an antidepressive or anti-anxiolytic standpoint uh, is significant. So, so to me, I read that study with enormous optimism, right? Which is, if there is a way to give somebody 25 milligrams of psilocybin and get the same antidepressive benefits, but without these other side effects, uh, this is very exciting. This needs to be explored a heck of a lot further. Do you think that the study at least accomplished that as, as, as an outcome? Yeah, so people have said, well, why didn't you fight back with a journal? Why didn't you demand you know, that they were more positive? And, and the answer is, from my perspective, being the first ever psychedelic study in the New England Journal of Medicine tells the world that psilocybin is a medicine. And it's as good as Lexapro. And if you, anyone who reads the paper can see that it does do better on sexual dysfunction and it does do better on many of the other uh, issues that Lexapro is a problem with. And that it fits with the theory that one of the things, it's very, the reason Lexapro and other SSRIs dampen down sexual activity is because they dampen down the limbic system, which is the part of the brain which drives those behaviors. And also people on these drugs often say, yes, I, I, I don't feel depressed anymore. I don't, I don't, I don't cry. I, I don't have the, the distress that comes from seeing sad things on the TV. But they also say, but also I don't enjoy life as much because I, I'm kind of, my, my pleasures are blunted. Right, it's, and that it's all fits blunting with that theory. the top and the bottom. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Whereas psilocybin is, stopping the thinking and allowing the rest of your brain to work normally. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit Peter Atia, MD dot com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies.